Hi, welcome to the Falcon Physician Reviews course on pulmonary physiology. My name is Patrick Sosny. I'm an attending physician at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Pulmonary physiology is unique in what you're studying for step one of the boards in that the concepts that we discuss are going to be relevant to patient care. This is going to be much more high yield for not only step one of the boards, but also what you're going to be doing later taking care of patients on the wards. Diseases like asthma, respiratory failure are common and things that all physicians will have to deal with. We'll begin today's class by going through an overview, introducing some of the concepts we're going to be discussing in pulmonary physiology and pathophysiology. Hello and welcome to Falcon Physician Reviews course on pulmonary physiology. My name is Patrick Sosny. I'm an attending physician in pulmonary and critical care medicine at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Today we're going to be talking about pulmonary physiology, specifically going through how pulmonary physiology relates to some of the common diseases such as asthma and COPD. In the first section, we're going to be talking about some overview of general pulmonary physiology, how it relates to the anatomy and histology of the pulmonary system. The lungs have a pretty simple function. All they have to do is get oxygen into the body and get CO2 out of the body. Typically when we talk about bringing in oxygen, we refer to that as oxygenation. For oxygenation, the important step is gas exchange. It's actually the bringing oxygen in from the alveoli into the capillary. With regards to get, getting rid of carbon dioxide, typically that's referred to as ventilation. In that case, it's more just the mechanics of getting air in and out of the lung. Once the air is in the lung, in the alveoli, it's very easy for carbon dioxide to diffuse from the bloodstream into the alveoli, into the gas that you're going to exhale. The anatomy of the pulmonary system is pretty simple as well. We have an airway that branches into the lungs. Sometimes we refer to the bronchial tree because of that branching. The airways are made up of respiratory epithelium, and you know where you are in the airway by looking at what type of respiratory epithelium you have. In the right lung, there are three main lobes, the right upper lobe, right middle lobe, and right lower lobe, compared to the left lung that just has two lobes, the left upper and the left lower. The left lung actually has a, an, an equivalent of the right middle lobe. Sometimes that's the area referred to as the lingula. It's the area right next to the heart. The way that I remember that the right lung has three lobes and the left lung has two is I remember the tricuspid valve, which sits on the right side of the heart and pumps blood to the lungs, is, is a three cuffs valve. So tricuspid, three lobes on the right side. The pleura is the surface that lines both the chest wall and the lung in the thoracic cavity. We've got the visceral pleura that's adherent to the lung surface and the parietal pleura, which is adherent to the chest wall. The space in between those pleura are a, is a potential space. That pleural space is a potential space. And usually we don't see it in, unless something pathologic is happening. A couple of examples are given in the next few slides. This is an example of a pneumothorax, or a collapsed lung. In this case, air has gotten into the pleural space. You can see in the right lung, with the arrowhead, the area is much darker, much more homogeneous. That's because there's air in that pleural space. The white collapsed lung is pushed up against the mediastinum. This is compared to the left lung that has normal lung markings. You might see a pneumothorax from trauma, or sometimes you might see it spontaneously especially in tall, skinny males or in individuals with COPD or other obstructive lung diseases. Pleural effusion is another example of a pathological process that can happen in the pleural space. A pleural effusion is fluid of some kind in that potential space between the two pleura. Pleural effusions can be just transudative fluid, as in the case of heart failure, or they can be exudative fluid in the case of pneumonia or cancer. In this case, you can see a pleural effusion on the left side. 
The pleural effusion is very easy to see on the lateral view of the chest x-ray. We can see one side of the diaphragm being very well outlined, but we don't see the other, the left side of the diaphragm, because the pleural fluid has silhouetted or shadowed out that side. The respiratory epithelium line from the nose all the way down the pharynx, all the way down in the lung. So we have normal respiratory epithelium all the way down the respiratory tract. We typically break up the airway in the upper airway, which is the naso or oropharynx, the trachea. And as it branches in the lungs with the main stem bronchi and the lobar bronchi going to each of the lobes of the lung, we think of those more as the lower airways. Now, if you look at this cast of the bronchial tree, you can see the right side is much more of a straight shot down. That's important because if you were to aspirate something, swallow something down the wrong pipe, you're more likely to have that end up on the right side than on the left. This is important in people that have aspiration pneumonia, such as somebody who has too much to drink, passes out, and swallows their own vomit. Or it's also important in kids that will swallow all sorts of things that you end up having to fish out of more likely the right lower lobe than the left side. The right lower lobe is more of a straight shot than anything else. The bronchial tree branches extensively. It probably branches between 19 and 25 times, depending on who you ask. Obviously, with each branching, the airways get narrower and narrower, get smaller and smaller. But if you look at the total cross-sectional area, if you add up the area of all those branches, as you go out distal in the lung, actually the total cross-sectional area increases. Now remember this point because it's going to be important when we talk about airway resistance. There's also a change in the type of epithelium we see from the upper airway down to the portion of the lung where gas exchange occurs. In the upper airway, we see pseudostratified columnar epithelium. This pseudostratified columnar epithelium has cilia, or hair cells, which are involved in mucociliary clearance, basically getting stuff that shouldn't get down in your lungs out. You've got a layer of mucus that sits above this that makes up the phlegm that you cough up more of when you get sick. There are several different cell types that we see within the upper respiratory zone. We see the typical ciliated epithelium, but we also see goblet cells that secrete mucus. This is sometimes referred to as the conducting zone of the lung. It serves a purpose of warming and humidifying the air, and it also has that layer of mucus in the, ciliary cell, the cilia to help beat that mucus up and out that help trap any particles that we would inhale. There are certain diseases that can occur if this mucociliary clearance mechanism is dysfunctional. Cystic fibrosis is an example of this, as well as the immodal cilia syndrome, such as Cartagener syndrome. In these diseases, we see people typically with problems clearing upper airway infections, chronic infection of the lungs, and eventually leading to bronchiectasis, or dilation of the large airways. As we get down to the lower, or gas exchange portion of the lung, we see a change in the respiratory epithelium. Instead of having those pseudostratified columnar epithelium, we start to see flat, squamous epithelium. Mixed in with this are some endothelial cells that are also flat. The purpose of these flat cells is to allow for gas exchange, to allow oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse across that short distance. This is sometimes referred to as the respiratory zone of the lung, or the business end of the lung, where gas exchange occurs. Within the lung, there's a huge surface area for gas exchange. The whole point of branching out and going to a lot of different alveoli is to allow for a big surface area. And there's probably about 75 meters squared, or roughly the size of a tennis court, within our lungs. The blood supply to the lungs is a dual blood supply. You've got the pulmonary artery, which pumps deoxygenated or blue blood from the right side of the heart. Those pulmonary arteries always run right next to the bronchi. So if you ever see a histology specimen or even a radiology picture, 
you'll always know that the airway and the pulmonary arteries run together. The pulmonary artery will go down, branch out, and form a capillary network that is intercalated with the alveoli. Here in these alveoli, capillary junctions is where gas exchange occurs. Once the blood is oxygenated, it returns to the left side of the heart through the pulmonary veins. These veins carry red or oxygenated blood. But in addition to the pulmonary circulation, there's also what's called the bronchial circulation. The bronchial circulation branches off of the aorta. Not all, so the blood that supplies the bronchial circulation comes from the left side of the heart. It's red oxygenated blood. The bronchial circulation is important in a couple different conditions. Most importantly, when someone has hemoptysis or coughs up blood, it's usually a problem with bleeding from the bronchial circulation. So for example, if someone has bronchitis or lung cancer or bronchiectasis, any of the common conditions where you can see hemoptysis or coughing up blood, usually the problem is in the bronchial circulation. And an interventional radiologist can actually inject blood, inject a contrast material into those bronchial vessels and embolize off the one that's bleeding. The bronchial artery and the bronchial circulation, however, is not critically important. When we do a lung transplant, the transplant surgeon will hook up the pulmonary artery, hook up the pulmonary veins, obviously hook up the airways, but he or she is not going to spend any time hooking up the bronchial circulation. So you could argue whether or not we need the bronchial circulation at all. There's a dual innervation of the airways. Both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems have an output on the airways. The sympathetic nervous system, the fight, flight, or fight nervous system, acts through the beta-2 adrenergic receptors. When you stimulate these beta-2 receptors, you get relaxation of bronchial smooth muscles, and the airways get larger. You get bronchodilation. This is countered by the parasympathetic nervous system. When you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system via the M1 muscarinic receptors, you get contraction of bronchial smooth muscle. This leads to bronchoconstriction or the airways getting smaller. So the airway diameter is to some extent dependent on the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. This will become important when we look at pharmacologic agents that attempt to manipulate this because the relative diameter of the airway is very important to airway resistance, which is critical for diseases such as asthma and COPD or emphysema. In this question, we have a 16-year-old high school athlete who's running outside during spring training for soccer. She develops some shortness of breath. She gets tachypnic, breathing rapidly, and tachycardic, having a rapid heart rate. She actually has allergy-induced asthma. What agent should she take to alleviate her symptoms now and why? There's a couple important points I want to bring up about this question. First off, it notes that she's training outside during the spring. Spring might be a hint that this patient has some allergies. Spring, typically allergies are worse in the spring or in the fall. There also might be the suggestion that she ha has either exercise-induced asthma because it was developed, because it came on while she was exercising, or she may have some cold-induced asthma if she were training outside during a cooler day. As you're starting to read this question, you might think of some of the asthma, but then they give you later in the stem, actually describing that she's got allergy-induced asthma. This is a good point to not get too worried if you don't recognize something in the question. Sometimes they'll actually give you what they want you to be thinking about. So our 16-year-old high school athlete who's developed allergy-induced asthma, what agent do we want her to take to alleviate her symptoms now and why? Let's go through each of these answers. So ipratropium, in answer A, actually is not a leukotriene inhibitor at all, so that's incorrect. Albuterol is a beta-2 agonist, which does relax, relax smooth muscles, which does cause bronchodilation. So B seems like it should be right, but let's go and look at the rest of them. C, for motorol, is actually not an alpha agonist. It's actually a long-acting beta agonist, which does relax smooth muscle and does cause bronchodilation. 
but because formoterol is not an alpha agonist, let's cross that off the list. Prednisone, in answer D, is a glucocorticosteroid, which will cause bronchodilation and will decrease inflammation, but prednisone doesn't act that quickly. So this would not be an agent that would alleviate her symptoms now, as the question asks. Tolterdine actually is a muscarinic antagonist, which is going to relax smooth muscle. But tolterdine does not act in the airways. It doesn't act through the muscarinic receptors, instead acting through the nicotinic receptors. This actually, tolterdine, is a medicine used to sometimes relieve bladder spasms. So the correct answer here is B. And it's important to recognize that the, the question asked for which agent should she take to alleviate her symptoms now, that's what makes albuterol right and prednisone wrong. A 58-year-old gentleman is admitted to the hospital with an acute myocardial infarction, heart attack. He's got a history of very bad asthma, which he's been intubated for several times. What typical heart attack therapy might you want to avoid, or at least give cautiously? Let's go through each of these answers as well. Heparin is a blood thinner, and there's no real reason why you wouldn't want to give heparin to somebody, whether or not they've got asthma or not. Clopidogrel, or Plavix, is another blood thinner, and also wouldn't have too much effect on the respiratory system. Propranolol is a beta blocker. It's a medicine that you would give this person with a heart attack to decrease the myocardial demand. And it's important therapy for myocardial infarction. But propranolol, because it's a beta blocker, is going to block the beta-2 receptor and may cause bronchoconstriction. So this may be, a, may be the correct answer. Furosemide is a diuretic that shouldn't have any effect on the lungs in a patient with asthma at all. And oxygen would be helpful for somebody with myocardial infarction and probably not harmful to somebody with asthma. The correct answer here is C, propranolol. It's important to point out that propranolol is a nonspecific beta antagonist or nonspecific beta blocker. Most of the medications given now for a patient with a heart attack would be a specific, a beta-1 specific blocker, such as metoprolol. So propranolol is the correct answer here but it's really not used in medical practice much anymore. Question three, we've got a 66-year-old smoker with severe COPD. He's got chronic cough, heavy mucus production. What agent might, might, might best relieve his symptoms? Let's go through each of these answers. These are many of the same answers that we saw for the question of the patient with the high school student with asthma. Ipratropium is a muscarinic antagonist. It does cause bronchodilation. And it also decreases mucus production. Albuterol is a beta-2 agonist, which does relax spoon muscles and does cause bronchodilation. Salmeterol is a long-acting beta agonist. It does relax smooth muscles. It does cause bronchodilation. Prednisone is a glucocorticosteroid. It does cause bronchodilation, and it does decrease inflammation. And oxygen would be helpful for hypoxemia. So really, all of these answers could be correct. But the question asked, which agent might be best relieve his symptoms of productive cough? And ipratropium, or the muscarinic antagonist, is actually does the most to decrease mucus production. So A, ipratropium, is the correct answer. Question four doesn't have a multiple choice associated with it. And this is more of a, quote, pimp question than something you might see on the boards. 66-year-old gentleman with COPD is admitted to the hospital with a COPD flare. He's getting frequent nebulizer treatments. You examine him and notice that he's got a blown or widely dilated pupil. What's happening? Does this patient have an inner cerebral bleed and does he need a stat head CT? No, actually what's happening is the patient has developed a response to the muscarinic antagonist, his ipratropium that he's receiving via the nebulizer. The nebulizer gives the medicine through a face mask, and sometimes some of that medication can get up into the eyes. When the muscarinic antagonist, or ipratropium, and the beta agonist act on the eye, what they can do is block the muscarinic, stim muscarinic stimuli, which are causing the eye to get smaller, and you're left with unopposed adrenergic stimuli and get a widely dilated pupil. 
the adrenergic receptor to the eye is an alpha-1, not a beta receptor, so it's not affected by the beta agonist. Air moves passively along pressure gradients. Basically, air moves downhill. It goes from areas of high pressure towards areas of low pressure. The way we get air in and out of our chest is to contract our diaphragm, raise our intrathoracic space, decrease our intrathoracic pressure, causing air to move downstream in the lungs. When intrathoracic pressure is lower than atmospheric pressure, the air comes in. When interthoracic pressure is higher than atmospheric, as air builds up over the course of a normal inspiration, air moves out. In general, inspiration is an active process where muscles in the diaphragm contract, whereas quiet normal, quiet normal exhalation is a passive process. Diaphragm contracts, interthoracic pressure drops, air moves in. That's inspiration. When the diaphragm relaxes, usually passively, intrathoracic pressure rises, air flows out. That's exhalation. The primary respiratory muscle is the diaphragm. It's innervated by the phrenic nerve. C345, keep the diaphragm alive. It's a good mnemonic, good way of remembering it. That's particularly important because if somebody has a spinal cord injury at the level of C345 or higher, he or she is going to require mechanical ventilatory support. They're not going to be able to move their diaphragm. They're not going to be able to breathe on their own. There are many secondary muscles of respiration, such as the intercostal muscles in between the ribs, the sternocleidomastoid and scalene muscles in the neck, and the abdominal muscles, which are particularly helpful for forced expiration, for forcing air out. Forced expiration is important when we exercise, and it's also important in cases where someone has obstruction to getting air out, as in the case with asthma or COPD. We'll talk about more later. That concludes the first module of this lecture. We've discussed some of the relevant anatomy, histology, pharmacology, and some of the neuromuscular interactions that help us place into context the physiology we're going to talk about in later sections.